very good. Glad to see you. Glad to see you on this Sunday evening. I feel like I've not been in Sunday evening in a month, but we're back at it. I, we have to switch things around in the summertime, and it uh, won't be long on Sunday nights in August. We usually do some fellowships, some ice cream fellowships, and some watermelon, and some uh, some of those nice refreshments in the evening, and I'll preach real fast, you'll listen real fast, and we'll eat. How about that? Very good. Brother Jim used to say that all the time. I stole that from him. He'd say he wouldn't be feeling very good, you know. And he'd say, hey, church, if you'll listen fast, I'll speak fast, and we'll go home. So, Amen. Well, let's stand together. If you wouldn't mind, we will stand together and appreciate it. It's been a good day. It's always have a good day when folks trust the Lord and baptism waters are stirred and People come close to the Lord, and it's always a good day. I was so hoping the youth would be here to this morning, but I did not realize the the sickness had went through the uh, dorm there. But uh, they'll be back next week. Charity told the girls, she, Emily, she said, you thought you got out of it. It looks sound like you're going to do it next week. So <laughs> but anyway, we appreciate that so very much. Let's ask God's blessing on the service. Father, we do pause and just recognize uh, your goodness. We recognize uh, just the opportunity to be in your great work in this town. Thank you for letting us be a, a very small part in this great work you're doing in Claiborne County. And, Lord, I appreciate the opportunity and the influence and the uh, just the opportunity that you've given us to uh, be a part of such a great work. No greater work on all the earth than the work of God. May souls be saved and lives be changed and hearts be put back together and just... Lord, all the great things that you want to do in this town, and you've chose uh, your church to work through. And help us to be a part of that great church, and a body of people in this town, and the believers that are want to see the uh, work go forward. Bless now as we sing and preach. Lord, I just want to uh, give uh, what you have been, uh, what you've given to me. I pray for those struggling. I pray for those, Lord, that at this very moment that are in the balance, I'd ask, Father, that you'd strengthen and help them. And guide us and direct us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nothing but the blood, 314. Take your hymn book there if you don't, or we can look on the screen. Rex is back in the saddle, so we'll see it on the screen. So uh, we sing it out under the Lord. Who likes the screen, by the way? Well, y'all just voted right there. I didn't even know it. <laughs> Somebody today said they'd like to see a screen on this side. I said, okay. He said, how much? I said, oh, no, that's Rex. So if you want to see a screen on this side, they're going, we'll have this one on this side very long so you all can look that way. I guess that'll be y'all's screen, and this will be y'all's screen, and in the middle, y'all don't get a screen. <laughs> so this church will be split, won't it? This, <laughs> two screens, yeah. Very good. Well, I appreciate all that's supporting and, and uh, seeing it all go for the Apparently, they like it, so... Let's praise the Lord. Would you do that? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you need a hymn book, 586. No, not 586. 314. 314. What can... say turn back now, but we're going to sing at Calvary. Years I've spent in vanity and pride, caring not, my Lord was crucified. At Calvary. 587 is the hymn number if you need it. 587.
seated. If you've got a bulletin there handy, we'll go over a few things that are coming up. Obviously, we've got VBS coming up the end of this month, and that is the big thing on our schedule. But we also have coming up here in the 19th of July, we have an Awana training for all Awana leaders. So if you've been in actively involved in the Awana program, we have a, a very special training. We've actually got um, some people from Awana are going to come and they're going to sit down with us and go over the Awana program, just give us a little more insight in depth in how to um, better utilize the program. So if you're interested in that training, that will be Tuesday, July the 19th, right here at the church. It'll be from 7 to 9 in the evening, so that's something that's coming up. Wednesday, July 20th, is our monthly men's fellowship. All men are welcome if your schedule permits and you can get away. We meet here at the church at 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning. We do serve breakfast. There's a sign-up sheet on the foyer table if you want to put your name down on that. And then Vacation Bible School, July 25th through the 29th. Um, Pre-registration is available. Um, if you have a Facebook, you can go out there on the church page and you can share our post that we put up about registration. I've actually had several people that have done that and people have registered on the website for that. So it does work, um, but that helps get the word out. Like Pastor was saying this morning, we are the only church in the area that I know that is doing this Vacation Bible School program, so that can be a big draw to get people to come out because it's something different. It's not the same thing everybody else has done. Um, so that will be huge. Um, the gospel will be very present in every lesson. Um, and so it's going to be a great outreach tool. I'm excited about it. We'll start at 545 with um, a meal, and then the activities will start from 630 to 8 p.m., and we'll be playing games and doing crafts and learning about it. It's the Ten Commandments is the, the main theme, so we'll be learning about the Ten Commandments through the week. If you're able and can bring cookies or brownies, Miss Lois would like those here no later than the Sunday before VBS, so that would be July the 24th. They can be whatever kind of cookie you want. They can be store-bought. They can be homemade. Um, they can be a mixture of both, whatever your fancy is, but she can use cookies and brownies to use during snack time um, for the children. And then Sunday, July 31st at 4 p.m., we'll have our mid-year business meeting, um, and that's open to anybody that is interested in, in that. And then coming up in August, we've got our Awana kickoff will be August the 3rd. And school starts back for Claiborne County on August the 8th. And all of God's parents said, amen. And all God's children said, not so much. Teachers, not so much. It feels like every summer goes by faster and faster and faster. Jeez. All the retired teachers says, <laughs> All right, we'll take up an offering, so men that are, are helping out with that tonight, if you want to come on forward. The work of God never stops. It's always advancing. And uh, got all these fine-looking young men. You're very welcome. I did that on purpose. I did it on purpose. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for another opportunity to be here in your presence. Lord, and we're humbled. We come humbly but boldly to your throne of grace, and we pray that you would be honored, your name would be lifted up, and uh, you would be pleased with, with us tonight. Lord, I pray that you would anoint our preacher, anoint our pastor with the Holy Spirit tonight, that he would preach boldly and exactly what we need to hear to challenge and encourage our lives. Lord, I do pray for this offering. Lord, your work is ongoing, and to encompass a city comes cost. Lord, I pray that you would bless, Lord, that you would use the offering that's given to further the work here that you've given us to do. Lord, be with the gifts, be with the giver alike. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, our pastor is going to come. He's going to open God's word to us. I'm excited for that. But right before he does, Brother Kevin Creasy is going to come and sing for us. 
Daniel asked me this morning if I might would have something we could sing this evening. Really hadn't rested on anything. And then the message that our pastor brought this morning. We've all heard the stories of Achan and sin in the camp. But he gave us instructions on trials and temptations that may come our way and how we can avoid them, how we can get away from them. But sometimes there's some things that the Lord just puts us through. We don't understand why. But it's one, if you, uh, not to steal the quotes, but it's one, if he'll bring you to a trial, he'll bring you through a trial. If he puts one before you, he can help you out. You won't be the first person that he's ever done that for. So oftentimes we think, woe is me. Why is all this on me? Why am I having to suffer through this? Why am I having to go through this? You're not the first. You won't be the last. But the one thing we've got to remind ourselves of, and that's where we're to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ as well, that you can get through it. You'll make it through it. You may not feel like you will. But again, you wasn't the first person to have a trial and tribulation come your way. He won't be the last one, but he's been with each person all the way through. Uh, this is an old one. Uh, I'm sure many of you know it. It's uh, We'll try it for you. It's God leads us along. <clears throat> In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley, the darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Away from the mire and away from the clay, God leads his dear children along. Away up in glory, eternity's day, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Hey, brother, good job. <clears throat> Thank you, brother. Thank you. Very good. Well, if you have your Bibles, there, turn with me to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. Very few times... Very few times do I ever get a message out of the air. And what I mean by that, um, the message that I usually bring comes out of the study or my study or my studying. Uh, I don't think over the 15 years that I've pastored this church that I've had a message dropped in my lap, so to speak. 
you got to study for it. He says, study to show yourself approved. And I'm not the student that I should be, but somebody asked me, how do you get all those things out of the Bible? I study it. <laughs> sort of like math or science or English. I need to study that probably, but there takes effort and energy and deliberate effort. The other day I was out in the barn and walking around and God just gave me a thought. And I told my wife, I came back in, I said, God just, I just, you know, you don't hear the Lord's voice audibly, but in your mind and in your heart, he just spoke to you about it, you know. And the phrase that he brought to my mind was, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I don't know who it's for tonight. I don't know what the situation is. But if you have your Bibles there in Genesis chapter 6, so I came in from the barn and messed around the house there, you know, a little bit, and I got my Bible out, and I searched out how many times I found that phrase. Noah found grace. Moses found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then I began to meditate on that phrase. Just I hadn't even picked up my Bible yet. I was just meditating on that phrase and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to me as I meditated on that phrase. And I thought, how did he find grace? Why did he find grace? What was in his life that he needed grace? Noah found grace. If he found it, that means either he was seeking it or he needed it. And I thought, boy, that would help the people of Twin City Baptist Church. We need to find grace. We need to search for it. No doubt Noah uh, was a man that was a, a, a righteous man. But I found something when I got to chapter 6, when I looked up that phrase and found that it was in chapter 6 of Genesis. And I'll read a few verses here. Let's read a few. If you have your Bible there, let's read a few and let's get the that phrase and let's see what's going on in the life of Noah as you probably know this very well but I think it'd be a good good message for tonight let's 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 read just a few in Genesis chapter 6 the Bible says and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. That's interesting. It probably was their sister. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> cousin. Second cousin. Verse 3 says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and, and also after that, when the sons of men came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and, same, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Let me just stop here and say this. That was not angels, by the way. Angels could not have relationships with human beings. They are sexless in the Scripture, except two that we know of, Michael and Gabriel, and they just have masculine names that they referred to as men. But in all of the Bible, other than those two incidences, they're neutral in their gender. And so we understand that they couldn't have relationships. You know, a lot of uh, some so-called scholars believe that angels had relations with people and they had giants. That's an impossibility. They're sexless. But we understand the sons of God with a line of Seth and... Uh, the daughters of men, and so that was a fallen race, uh, race, race there. And so there's another Bible study, but that's just something I wanted to throw out there. Verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man of the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repenteth me that I have made them and then that famous phrase that I want to speak on just for the next few minutes while we're together but Noah I circled those two words but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord these are the generations of Noah 
Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and for all flesh was, had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them from the face of the earth. I'm going to pause there for just a minute. And I read those verses because I want you to see how it surfaces that the reason Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord was because he was living in wicked times. There's no mystery that we're living in wicked times. And I am fearful that people of God get in their mind that it's so wicked that we can't live for God. And if you leave here with anything tonight, I want you to leave here with this idea a biblical idea that you can still serve God in a wicked world. You can still do right in a wicked world. You do not have to succumb to the, the violence and the criminal act and the sinful behaviors of our society. I'm thankful for the opportunity God has given us to be a witness. And I said this the other day, we ought to and when we can and God brought me to that place where I had to decide to do it, but he's going to bring you to a place, he's going to bring me to a place where we've got to stand for truth. The world does it. The world is loud and boisterous in their vile behavior. They're wild and boisterous with their violent acts, and yet we Christians sometimes sit back and say, I hope they don't ask me something. We live a... We live a, 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 a a wimpy life, if you will, the lack of better words. And, but I want you to know, I want you to be encouraged here tonight that you can still serve God in a lost and dying world. I think it's very interesting. We're only in chapter 6 of Genesis. <laughs> God just had created man just prior to this. What I'm trying to tell you, he, he didn't go very long until he corrupted. He didn't go very long until he was absolutely sin-sunken. He was deep. He was eyeball deep in sin. And matter of fact, God was so sick of it. If you'll read it in with these verses, verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. Wouldn't you like to be in a place where there's no sin? There's coming a day called heaven. It's going to be nice. You don't have to lock your door. The Bible says the gate's going to be open. There's not going to be no lights there. I mean, no uh, locks there. There'll be light. Jesus will be the light. But there's no going to be a need for thieving and for locks. And, and you, ought to, you ought to just sit down sometime and do a little inventory of the things you have to have now uh, for safety. And there's not going to be any cameras. There's not going to be any safety teams. And there's not going to be any uh, uh, background checks. There's not going to be any uh, thumbprints. And there's not going to be any kind of a, a physical. And there's not going to be any of that stuff. You ought to sit down sometime and just think about the things we have to do now that's not going to be in heaven. He'll encourage you. <laughs> No doctor visits, no blood drawn. Anybody with high cholesterol said amen right there. <laughs> but for now, we're in a war. But take heart, beloved. Find grace in the eyes of the Lord. The corruption of the people in the earth does not determine the grace of God to those that seek it. Just because it's bad and just because it's violent and just because it's on every hand and just because it is what it is does not change the grace of God, does not change this, the consistency of God, does not change the power of God. Sin will never change who God is. He's the same God today as he was in the days of Noah. He's the same God uh, that holds the wind in his fist. The same God that controls uh, the wind. He's the same God that created the ocean. He's the same God uh, in, day, in Noah's day that he is in your day, in my day. Find grace in the eyes of the Lord. It was so wicked. And I've always, I've done a little study on verse number 6. And to be very honest with you, I've never really wrapped completely around that it repented the Lord. 
I, I understand what it's like to change my mind. Man, I wish I hadn't have done that. Mm. Especially when I run off the road, you know. <laughs> I wish I hadn't have done that. We all understand those mistakes, and, I, and we're not a mistake, and God's not speaking of a mistake here, but we do understand the word repentant means he's changed his mind. I think that's fascinating. I, I don't know all the sovereignty of God, and I, I, wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even beg to, to dabble into that. But it's interesting that God says, it repented me that I even made a man. That's an interesting study. He said, it repented him that he made him. Notice verse 6, it repented the Lord that he had made him on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. I, I, I don't want to live my life where I grieve the heart of God. I, I don't want to live in such a way that where God looks down and he's disgusted with me. Now, no doubt, uh, in my sinful nature, yes, but in the righteousness of Christ, in his own dear son, I'm not. But that, that repentant, that repentance that he is expressing it's pretty interesting. If you hold your place, go with, go with me to the book of Luke. Would you, real quick, we'll come right back to Genesis, but would you turn over to Luke chapter 17? Just to identify a little bit more of this corruption, just to solidify just a little bit more of how it is, in Luke chapter 17, in verse 27, the Lord Jesus Christ gives us a little bit of a more of a detail about the wickedness of our day. Now, we won't take time to read all the verses, but if you'll read verse 22, it talks about the coming of the Lord and what's going to be going on in verse 25. and verse 26, the Bible says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. So in Genesis chapter 6, that I just read to you, the same thing or worse will be going on when the Son of Man is coming. So that tells me that we are not going to make the world a better place. We are not going to revolution. Now, I want revival, and, and that is to get people saved. That revival is maybe the church get reignited in the work of God. But I'm telling you something, the world is going to worsen. You can get it out of your mind thinking that, we'll, uh, that we're going to have this great big revival one day and the entire world is going to get saved. It's not going to happen. You know what it's going to do? It's going to worsen and worsen and worsen. But what you and I can do while we're here is find grace in the eyes of the Lord and do our great work and stay the course and get the gospel of those know we love and those we come in contact with and reach and help that one and reach and help that one and do that one we could and and, and get uh, influence there and do what we can while we can. But look, the world is going to hell. Just as it was in the days of Noah. Notice he says in verse 26, 27. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage under the day that Noah entered into the ark. Right up to the very end, it's going to be bad. As you go on, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Verse 28, likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Matter of fact, that's a good, that's a good Bible principle to attach yourself to that we are not going to go through the tribulation. I'm not for one second going to the, the tribulation. The church of the living God will not go through the tribulation. I'm a pre-tribulation rapture. I'm not going through the rapture. You know what? The ark that is represented in the book of Genesis, and he mentioned it in the Luke chapter number 17, was that when they got in that ark, they did not suffer the wrath of Almighty God. In Christ, you will not suffer the wrath of Almighty God. The wrath that God is going to put upon this earth was put upon his son. The reason God is going to put his wrath upon this earth is because of sin. And when you get in Christ... You are, you are positioned in him, and he is not going to bring his son through tribulation. I'm in Christ. I'm in the ark, so to speak. 
I, I'm in the body of Christ, and you are too if you know Christ. Now, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you will go through the tribulation. If you reject the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will find the mark of the beast. Uh, you will go through the tribulation. You will uh, be deceived by the Antichrist, and you will die and spend the rest of eternity in the lake of fire. That's the truth. But here he's saying, in those days, it was bad. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodomy was there. Sodomites was there. Homosexual lifestyle was there. The girls had come back from camp and was telling us all the things that they had learned and was pretty adamant about it, about abortion. Amen. About same-sex marriage. Amen. If anybody ought to be saying it, the church ought to be saying it. Christian people, Christian kids ought to leave the church house saying, a man ought not marry a man. A woman ought not marry a woman. It's against God. You ought not kill your babies. That's against God. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. And they come home a little bit disturbed, and they said, you know, violent. Look, that's what it ought to be seen. That is against God. And what the world is doing is loud and boisterous and uh, telling us to sit down and shut up. And, and there's sodomy and, 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 and homosexuality and, and abortion and all the wickedness of our world's going on. And we're just sitting there saying, I hope they don't ask me. <laughs> that was going on in Noah's day, too. Lot's day. If Lot hadn't been a Christian, if Lot hadn't been a believer, he'd have died with them. And the crazy thing about that, this ain't got nothing to do with the message, but Lot was so stooped in that lifestyle, not, not sodomy, but he was so stooped in that city with that lifestyle, he got so accustomed to it, he got so used to seeing it, that when they come to knock on Lot's door to have relations with the angels that came to the door, Lot was so deprived in his own mind, he gave them his own daughters. He said, take my daughters and leave them. Don't touch these men. He knew they were angels of the Lord. He knew they were holy men of God. He knew that they couldn't touch those men. And he was so deprived in his mind. He's a Christian. Lot was a believer. But he had been deluded. He had been listening to the world so long. And it was so much sunken in that stuff. He said, here, take my daughters. His virgin daughters, by the way. Who were pure and holy in the sense of their Gender, but yet he was deprived. You'll see in Lot's wife, she turned and looked at the city. And the Bible says she became a pillar of salt. There's so much typology there, but I want to get back to Genesis chapter 6. I said all that with that urgency. I said all that with that specific tone. Because I want you to know that we're living in those same days. But I also want you to know you can find grace in the eyes of the Lord. You can find grace. You don't have to succumb to the same cesspool of sin that the world's doing. I might remind you that Noah raised three sons. And they got on the boat. Hey, the world, excuse me, the world can go to hell as your family gets on the boat. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I can't help but think, if nothing else, he got his family. If nothing else, if he found grace only for his own family, found grace only for his own family, that was enough. No doubt he was probably brokenhearted. Don't you know he had neighbors? Don't you know he had friends? Don't you know he had other relatives? Don't you know he knew people, maybe in business, maybe in uh, some acquaintance. No, no doubt he knew somebody in his realm of living that did not get on the boat. I think we fail to realize sometimes that Noah lived 120 years. We know he lived that long, and he worked. He come in contact with other people. He was not isolated. He, 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 didn't, he didn't exempt himself from society, so he had friends. And I have in my mind's eye, he's standing on the boat, no doubt preaching for seven days. You read the scripture, and you'll find that he stood on the board, door, the door of the boat for seven days and preached. Repent! Repent! And as the rain fell, the scripture says the rain fell, and water began to, began to be up on the earth. And what he said was true was happening. 
I don't know about you, but I'm not real smart. But if I heard a man preach and for 120 years, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain. I may have laughed at him, but when it started to rain, I thought I'd run to the boat. When the rain started coming and the animals knew it, animals had more sense than the people. When the rain started happening, the animals started coming. Two by two, the Bible says. They got on the boat. The human depravity at this level is un unimaginable. The human depravity has caused the judgment hand of God to fall on every single human being and animal except Noah and his family. You know why? Because he found grace. If I could encourage you this evening, find grace in the eyes of the Lord. How do you do that? Well, let's do what Noah did. The first thing I want to see is verse number 9. I get three out, get them all three right out of verse number 9. I want to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, you want them? Look at the first one. He was a just man. He was a just man. Can I put it as as simple as I can put it? Do right. That is an elementary theology if there's ever been anything said. Just do right. It's as simple as breathing. It was simple as saying do right. That word just means to be right with God. My question to you tonight is, are you right with God? Is everything lined up with you and God? Is your relationship with Him as it should be? I'm not saying we're not sinners. I'm not saying we're not failures in some sense of our Christian life. But I'm saying, is there a clean slate between you and God? Is it right here? Most every single morning, Lord, I cleanse my mind, cleanse my heart before I stand. Every Sunday morning before I stand in this pulpit, I say this thing here. Lord, cleanse my heart and give me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. I want to be right with you. I want to be thoroughly right with you at most all times. I'm not the way, I'm sure, but I, that's my prayer. Lord, I want to be right with you. I want to be a just man. I want to be justified. I cannot in my own flesh, I cannot in my own ways, but I can in Christ. Matter of fact, Job asked that question. I'll turn over real quick to Job chapter 9. Job asked that question. He said, can, can that be possible? Is that, a, is that a legitimate question? Can I be right with God? In Job chapter 9, verse number 2, the Bible says, Then Job answered and said, I know it is of a truth, but how should Man, be just with God. How can I be just with God? How can I be justified? How can I be a just man? Well, now turn over with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 tells us how to be a just man. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20. Notice these verses. Therefore, by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So in the law itself, they do not justify me. How do I be just? I read the Ten Commandments. I read the law. I find out what God says about sin. I'm guilty. Can't do anything about it. Oh, no. I appreciate the Ten Commandments in our vacation Bible school. Ten Commandments get you lost. The Ten Commandments tells you that you're a sinner. You read the Ten Commandments, you won't read them very long till you're going to be guilty. <laughs> I told the story real quickly, but that little Spanish fella, I was trying to win him to the Lord, and I've been watching some of the way of the Master, and he does a great job about witnessing the people about using the Ten Commandments. And he was trying to tell me he wasn't a sinner. This little Spanish fella said he wasn't a sinner. He said, me no sinner. I said, okay. I said, uh, you ever lied? He said, oh, maybe once. And I said, uh, you ever steal? He said, uh, maybe twice. And then I said, get down. I said, you ever had a bad thought? He said, me big sinner. <laughs> yeah. You go to reading the Ten Commandments, you going down through there, and you find the lot list of God's laws, you can say, yep, guilty. <laughs> Sorry. And the bad thing is, you break one, you broke them all. James tells us that. So you're guilty, and I'm guilty. And Job's asking this question. So okay, oh, he wants me to be just. How can I be just? I can't be justified in my own flesh because I'm guilty. Got the answer. Look what verse 21 of Romans chapter 3. But now, I love the but nows of the Lord, of the Scripture. 
But now the righteousness of God is without the law, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets are together being a witness. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ upon all of them that believe, there is no difference. Amen. <laughs> I am justified, I am a just man, not by my good deeds. I'm a failure. I break them, I destroy them, I burn them. But I can be a just man in Christ Jesus. The righteousness of God has been placed upon me through the blood of Jesus Christ and faith in Him. I am a justified person because of what Jesus did on the cross. See, salvation is not just for the instant. Salvation is not just for eternity. Salvation is for present. I can be justified in the presence of God. God can look at me right now and be justified, not because I got a suit on, because he knows my heart. I'm justified because I'm in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm in him. I, I, it's sort of like hiding this pulpit. I'm, I, I'm behind him. I'm in him. So Jesus is my righteousness. No flesh is justified in the sight of God. You know why God said Noah was just? It's because he was a believer. That's why. He was a just man. Notice the second thing. Right in the same text, verse number 9. He was a perfect man. And I always like to say he was not a perfect person. Perfect here means complete. Perfect here means he was mature. What God was saying was that Noah was a man that believed God. He was justified because he believed in him. But he, he no doubt was perfect in his maturity. He was complete. He made the decisions to do what God told him to do. If you'll jump down to verse number 14. Something that identifies to me that Noah was a perfect man. Meaning mature. Meaning complete. Meaning trustworthy. You know what he gave him to do? The biggest task of the human race. To make an ark. You don't give that task to people you don't trust. You don't give the task... To make the iconic item at the ark. You don't, you don't give people that task without trusting them. You don't give people that task without being them being mature. You know as well as that. If you've been in any kind of leadership or any kind of a, a overseer or whatever. You don't give keys to people that are immature. You don't give keys and responsibility to people that cannot handle it. God gave. You know you can go anywhere. I've heard missionaries. And I've heard Brother Steve Lawwell say this. He's been all over the world and Ken Ham and all those creationist people. And I've watched videos and they've said everywhere they've ever been, they can't even speak English. They can't even speak uh, 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 any known language that, th that the person knows. It's all their own language. Anytime you show them the ark, they know what that is. That is iconic in its item. It's iconic when you show an ark, they say, yeah, flood. They know something about a flood. They know something catastrophic. They know something globally happened when you identify that item. What am I saying? I'm saying you don't give that task to unperfect people or immature people. God gave the task to Noah because he, know, he knew Noah would do it. He was perfect. He was complete. He was mature. We all need to be working on our spiritual maturity. We all need to, uh, excuse me, we all need to grow up spiritually. You know some verse that gets me all the time? You know the Bible says, He that loves thy law and nothing shall offend them. Do you know the Bible just described it for us? If you ever get offended, that means... The law of God is slipping from you. That's strong, isn't it? <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 10, I'll move along. 1 Corinthians 10, and verse chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13, and verse number 10. Listen to these words. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I become a man, I put away childish things. 
to be what Noah is in these verses, he wasn't making childish decisions. We all understand as parents, as our child grows, they can handle more. They can handle this responsibility, okay? Now they can handle this responsibility. And it grows and grows and grows and grows as they grow. As a 14, as maybe a 12, or maybe even a 9-year-old, you don't pitch a set of keys and say, hey, have a good life. They're not ready for that. God is the same way. But we understand he was a just man because God, uh, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he was a just man and he was a perfect man. He was complete. He was mature. He was growing. <clears throat> and all that is solidified in the third one. He was a just man. He was a perfect man. And the Bible says, and Noah, I love that. And Noah, he, he mentioned his name, walked with God. You want to find grace in the eyes of the Lord? I do. You're not going to find it if you're not walking with him. Excuse me. I come across a lot of people with a lot of problems. And I hear a lot of this. I don't know why, preacher. I don't know why. I don't know why. I da da. And I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. And I'm not making light of people's troubles. But you know why a lot of that is? They're not walking with him. That's the truth. That's the cold, hard facts. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. You break the law. I'm talking about the law of God. You stay in disobedience. You stay out of his house. You stay out of his word. You don't give yourself to him. You don't walk with him. You don't have a relationship with him. You don't pray. You don't give. You don't do. You don't, and you don't expect God to fall over backwards? It ain't happening. I'm not talking about works for salvation. I'm talking about because you have a heavenly father that loves you and have a heavenly father that wants a relationship with you and you turn your back on him and say, I'll check with you later, Lord. You think God's going to say, you're going to find grace in my eyes? God's not a man, but I am telling you this. He was, we were made in his image. And whatever you're feeling in relationships with life, God's, God's above that. We understand he's not bound by our feelings and our emotions. But I am saying he's been touched with the feelings of our infirmities and yet without sin. But we understand everything we ever, ever feel, he understands it. You know as well as I do, you, you may be more spiritual than me, but someone sticks their nose up at you or doesn't speak to you or doesn't talk to you or doesn't have time for you, and you're going to run after them? No. You know why God gave him grace? Because he was close. Now God's forgiving. God's loving. God's kind. God's all, uh, all along suffering. I, I'm not minimizing God's attributes. But I am saying this. You're not going to distance yourself from him and then get grace from him. That's not happening. You know when I find myself cold and indifferent? Guess what's lacking? Grace. <laughs> he walked with him. Look at this with me if you will. I got it on the screen. I'm loving the screen. Y'all don't see this, but I see it back there. I ain't got to look at my notes now. You know why I know he walked with him? He spoke to him. He didn't scream at him. He was close enough to speak to him. He found grace. Who are you the closest to? The people you spend the most time with. He spoke to him. And as I said, he gave him the biggest task of all of humanity. Build an ark. I, I can't help but think he didn't have to run to and fro. God did not have to run to and fro say, Man, I got I to gotta find somebody to build an ark. I got to find somebody. To, this is corrupt. Oh, my goodness. I got to find somebody. Hey, anybody want to build an ark? Wanna be? No. Oh, Noah's right there. I bet he, never, he didn't even have a thought. Noah's right there. Sometimes we neglect the things that's closest to us. He talked with him. He trusted Noah. Notice verse 6, 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms thou shalt make it in the ark. Thou shalt pitch within and without. Could you imagine, just for a minute, he, he said, uh, uh, Noah, I want you to build an ark. Yes, sir. I want you to put some pitch on it. Yes, sir. I never read where Noah says, Lord, I got a better idea. I don't think I'm going to put any pitch on it. 
Well, pitch is the, is the tar. Pitch is the, is the uh, tree sap, or pitch is the liquid, or pitch is the, I'm going to call it the paint on. I'm going to call it the block filler. Flex seal, yeah. I'll get a, I'll get a commission off that. That, 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 is the, that is the stuff that he painted on there to keep it from leaking. What if Noah would have said, no, Lord, I, I think we ought not use pitch. That's really a little too far away for the boys to go get. I'm going to use something else. It's going to sink. I don't, I don't read where Noah is arguing with him. That tells me a lot about Noah. God said, build an ark? Yes, sir. Build it this way? Yes, sir. Build this dimension? Yes, sir. If you ever had an opportunity to go to the ark in Cincinnati, you ought to go. It's staggering. It's absolutely staggering. I'll never forget riding that bus. They, take, they shuttle you around. And we come made that curve. I, mean, I read about it, but they built that thing to scale. I mean, it looks like a building laying on its side. I mean, it's just, I know some of it is a little, little imagination, but for the most part, it's d- dead on. And that one big door, we got a picture of it. Me and the kids got a big picture of that door. And all the animals, and uh, the scripture describes for us, they were on that ark about a year, feeding all the animals and w- removing of the waste and the ingenuity behind it the, the, uh, is absolutely genius. What, what, what if Noah had his own plan? failed Noah tr- God trusted him God spoke to him God trusted him and then chapter 7 verse 1 he preserved him look what it says in 7 1 and the Lord said unto Noah come thou and all thy house in the ark for thee have I seen righteousness before me in this generation that's when it counted you say man this life is gets it gets it gets lonely. It gets tired. I'm walking with the Lord every day, it seems like, and there's really nothing progressing. You know, really the Christian life, and I don't want to say it this in a negative way, but the Christian life sometimes can be just humdrum. You know, it can just, I'm just serving the Lord. I'm just going to church. I'm just trying to read my Bible. And ch- I mean, you know, it's long term. Christian life is long term. <laughs> You get this idea that this Christian life is, is, is instant, and, and I just want to be whatever now. But no, it's a long turning Ferris wheel, and it's just revolutions are real slow and real big. But I promise you this they will continue to roll. And when it makes a revolution and it comes back around, and God gives you a little bit of fruit along the way, you'll be glad you stayed the course. You'll be glad I found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm going to keep walking with him. I'm going to keep walking with him. I'm going to get up today and walk with him. I'm going to walk with him tomorrow. I don't understand all this. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to let him speak to me. I'm going to speak to him. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to walk with him. And guess what they do? He's going to open the door one day and say, here it is. One of these days, beloved, just like Noah, don't you know when he stood in that door, don't you know he was glad he found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Just stay the course. Just stay the course. You'll be glad when it's over. He was a just man. He just did right. He was a perfect man. He was mature. He was complete in his decisions. <clears throat> and he's determined every day I'm just going to walk with him. I'm just going to walk with him. I'm going to speak to him. He'll trust you. You can build. You can do. And then when it counts, you'll find grace in his eyes. Every one of us know people that haven't found the grace and they're struggling. And we have found people that are and have found the grace. There's a difference. There's a difference. Let's pray together. Father.